We're all interested in what is reality, either with a small r or a large r. And reality is what we perceive, isn't it? Well, in some audiences, people would probably say yes. In this audience, maybe not. So here's one of the, the many ways of demonstrating that what you perceive is not reality. Uh, this is a famous optical illusion where tiles A and B are the same shape, but they don't look that way. Here's the, the same thing animated to show that it, in fact, is the same color. It just doesn't look that way. And this is due to a perceptual trick in your brain. Your brain recognizes that when shadows occur, that things should look brighter because your eye is compensating for it. And so I could basically give a three-hour lecture only on visual perception and the illusions of it, but I'm just using this as a way to get you into the mindset that what we perceive is not the way the world actually is. Here's another example of the same thing. So the bottom looks white, basically, and the top looks dark. And we can simply cover up the edges and you see once again that it's actually not so different even though your brain is telling you that must be different, it's actually not. Here's another famous example. If you're imagining that you're looking at the spinning girl from the top, many people would look at this and say, well, she's spinning clockwise. How many of you see her spinning clockwise? And how about counterclockwise? Okay, so about half and half. Now what we'll do is say, here's the same thing, but look at the girl on the right and now look at the girl in the center. And now look at the girl on the left. And back into the center. So you can easily shift from one to, to the other simply by having a different context. So this is a way of showing that uh, and it's not only that what we perceive is an illusion, but the illusion is shaped strongly by context. Here's another one, famous uh, example of foreshortening. Of course, uh, street artists often use this kind of a trick. This would be much more difficult to do when we have virtual reality classes because the three dimensions, of course, immediately shows you that this is an illusion. Here's another example. Upside down, these women look perfectly normal. But when we turn it right side up, we see that something has gone dreadfully wrong. <laughs> And again, this is now due to a particular portion of your brain, which is hardwired to see faces. So when you see the face in this form, you know that it has face-like characteristics, and, but you don't see it in detail, so you can't figure out what's wrong with it. When you do see it in the correct context, you know that it's wrong. And what's happened, of course, is that the eyes and the mouth are turned upside down. So subjective and objective realities aren't the same. We see what we expect to see, and we believe what we hope to believe, or what we want to believe, as we see in politics all the time. People <laughs> believe what they want to believe. As a philosopher would call this naive reality, naive reality is a very thin slice of reality with a big R. So then, what is what is real reality? If, we're, if our brains are tricking us all the time, how do we know what's real? Well, there's a clue we can get from physics. And the clue is in the transition from the classical to the quantum world. From the classical perspective, we end up with, with various doctrines that we call things like locality, causality, a fixed reality, and space-time. Uh, these are all refinements of common sense. So locality basically says that in order to get anything to move or change, you need to shove it. Causality is the assumption of a uniform or a unidirectional movement of time, second law of thermodynamics, and your watch. Fixed reality says that even if you're not looking at something, it has fixed properties. So the, the famous case that Einstein was saying is that does that mean if you look at if you don't look at the moon, it's not there anymore? From a quantum perspective, the moon is still there, but it doesn't have the same properties as it does when you're looking at it. And space-time is the assumption of an absolute space and absolute time. This is what our everyday experience tells us. If these weren't the case, then you didn't have to move your body over here at this particular time in order to be in this room to hear what I'm saying. But we know that if you go down into the elementary particle world, all of that goes away. 
all of it is completely gone. It is a non-local world, it's acausal, it's a participatory universe, and it has an update virus protection. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's no space-time in that place. So the clue from physics says if you want to know what reality is, a deep physical reality, with a large R on reality, uh, it may not be anything like what we experience in the everyday world. So that's the world of separation, the everyday world, but that is a world of no separation at all. It's a completely holistic environment as far as we can tell. There are other hints about what real reality is, and this has to do with human experience. So you see here a chart where on one scale it's a kind of experience, whether it's mundane or profound, and on the other scale whether it's common or rare. So we simply start plotting these things. We have common and mundane gut feelings. Uh, how many of you have ever had a gut feeling about something which later turned out to be true? Yeah. How many have you never had a gut feeling of something that turned out to be true? Nobody. So I've asked the same question of audiences that were filled mostly of skeptics, like skeptic societies, before they knew I was going to talk about psychic phenomena. When I ask that question, roughly 75% of everybody says, oh yeah, that happened to me. But then I say, well, it might be a psychic phenomena, and then all the hands go down. <laughs> so everybody feels got feelings, feeling of being stared at. Telephone telepathy is when the phone rings and you know who's on the other end before you look at the phone. Distant knowing, distant healing, premonitions, creative insight, religious epiphany, and somewhere in the, near the top is full-blown mystical union. So who reports these things? At the common and mundane level, basically everybody has these kinds of experiences, but as you move up the scale, you start giving these people names, like healer, intuitive, genius, prodigy, saint, yogi. And the reason why I put it in this form is to simply point out that the, this is part of a spectrum of human experience. We call this, at, at IONS, we call it extended capacities of the mind, somewhat of a euphemism, so we don't have to talk about psychic or mystical experience, just exceptional experiences. And the spectrum is interesting because all of those phenomena are strange for one reason only. They're strange because they suggest that mind transcends time and space. And what they're telling us then is that while we know from a physics perspective that if you go into the quantum world, the deep physical world, time and space go away. And the same thing seems to happen at the level of human experience. So we're getting clues from both subjective and objective observations that there's something strange that happens when you look at the deep layer of reality. The other thing is that on the upper right of this, where we have the saints and the geniuses, these are people who are very rare, and it's beyond the reach of science. Actually, nobody understands why geniuses are able to do what they do, uh, but it's very well accepted because those are the people who shape civilization as we know it today. So the other side of the scale, very common effects, easy to study, but highly controversial within science. So there's a bit of a paradox built in there, right away. So in order to, to look at this in more detail, we now need to leave our senses into a land of trees that have little hats. Yeah. Oh, and puppy clouds. Puppy clouds that smile. I like this one. So what we do in the laboratory, and what has been done by colleagues around the world for about 150 years, is to study some subclasses of these kinds of experiences because they are amenable to laboratory tests. And they fall into these classes. Information passes between people who are isolated or are shielded from each other. We just simply label that telepathy. If a person's intention is impressed into the world in some way, we call it psychokinesis. If you get information from the world without ordinary senses, it's clairvoyance, and if it's slipped in time, it's precognition. If it's slipped in time the other way, it's retrocognition. That's knowing something about the past that you couldn't have known in any, any other way. So these have been reported throughout human history. They don't always have these names, but nevertheless, they're simply things that happen to people. So within this audience, how many of you have experienced one or more of these kinds of phenomena? And that's true basically of every audience. Again, even skeptics, if you use euphemisms for these words. So what do we do in the laboratory to study telepathy?
because just because people have these experiences doesn't necessarily mean that they're real. Because as we know, the brain is tricking us all the time. There are things that are illusions and coincidences. So how do we get beyond that and see what's really going on? <clears throat> there are a number of methods that have been used. The, probably the most famous one that's been repeated many, many times is called the Gonsfeld method. It involves a sender and a receiver who are isolated by shielding or by distance or by both. And the game is that you want the sender to send something mentally to the receiver and then judge whether or not they that would work. So the Gonsfeld technique, Gonsfeld is a German word meaning whole field. You shine a red light in the face of the receiver. And then you take a ping pong ball and you cut it in half. You put half of a ping pong ball over each eye. And then you take headphones playing white noise and they wear the headphones. So the, the receiver is asked to remain awake, but everywhere they look they only see pink and every, everything that they can hear is only a hissing sound. So what this does is within about 10 minutes most people will begin to get hypnagogic imagery. It's because your brain is thinking I'm awake, I should be seeing or hearing something, but there's nothing there, it's just unpatterned. And so you begin to basically hallucinate, but in a waking state. So it's very easy for imagery to arise. And this is done intentionally because we want the receiver to be in a state of waiting for some sort of stimulus to appear. The stimulus in this case is coming from the sender, the sender's thoughts. So the sender's trying to do that. And here's uh, where the lab used to be. At, at IONS, this is up at uh, Earthrise campus, uh, about 25 miles north of here. And in the basement of that building where Garrett now has his, his wet lab, his bio, biological lab, we had our physiology lab. So if you walk around the back of the building and went inside at that point, you would see our electromagnetically shielded room. This is almost 3,000 pounds of solid steel, double-walled, grounded box. So when, the, when you go in the room and the door is sealed, there's no external electromagnetics that come in that are above that are above 10 kilohertz. So very long radio waves are blocked, but 10 kilohertz and below are extremely low frequency waves and nothing blocks that other than about a mile of seawater. So we haven't done that experiment yet, but colleagues have used seawater. So in here, at least we know that any conventional means of signaling is not possible. In the box, we have a lady named Gail, who's having the ping pong balls put on her face. Uh, Gail is uh, one of these people who, whose uh, daily life is filled with spontaneous psychic events, synchronicities, things like that. She's also maybe the only, or one of the only women in the United States who's been initiated into both Mongolian and Siberian shamanism. So she has those qualities as well. So the person putting on the ping pong balls is our research assistant, Lima. So here's what we hope happens, that you want the sender to send something mentally to the receiver. You can't simply ask somebody to mentally come up with something and try to send it, because if the two people knew each other, then they have shared memory. And the likelihood is that if the sender thinks of something, there's a greater than zero chance that the receiver will think of it just because they happen to know who's sending. So instead, what you do is we, we prepare pools of targets beforehand, and then we randomly select a pool we randomly set one of the, of the targets within the pool. If the experiment works, then the receiver might get an image of an elephant in this case, or maybe just an animal that's gray, and then we record anything that they say. Because when you're in this Gonsfeld state, it's very difficult to remain analytic. So you're likely to forget what you said in the same way that you might forget what a dream was. So here's an example. The receiver is then taken out of the Gonsfeld condition after the sender is trying to send them something for about 20 minutes, play back anything they said. They might say an animal is gray. Uh, and then they look at four pictures, one of which is the real target, and then three decoys. And the game is basically a one in four game. So that by chance, the receiver would guess the right target one in four times. Sometimes people say, well, what would you do in a controlled context where there's no sender in this case? Uh, maybe you'd get more than one in four, to which our response is, how could you possibly get more than one in four, whether there's a sender or no sender? It's not possible, provided that there's no clue that's given. And of course, we're very careful not to give a clue, because the receiver has no idea what the target pool is, and they have no idea what the target images are. 
It's simply not possible to get more than one four unless information comes from somewhere else. So here's the session that we did with Gail. These are the four images that were chosen beforehand to be as different from each other as we could manage. One of, one of the four was selected by the toss of a die to be the target. So here's what Gail said. Something has a rough texture. By the way, this is around 80% of everything that Gail said in the course of 20 minutes. Something has a rough texture, tall looking up high, like in an art gallery or a museum. The Yosemite kind of image of a tall rock, monolithic. Gail, by the way, afterwards said that she didn't know what the word monolithic meant, but she knew that that word had something to do with the target. Images of Mount Rushmore and Half Dome like a big stone. So if you were a judge in this one session, which of the four targets do you think that the sender was sending? This is what was being sent. Now, the person sending this was her uh, contractor who was building uh, a building for her. And she, Gail happened to notice that uh, this guy named Ray uh, seemed to anticipate what she was thinking about in terms of, of the building. So she wanted a certain kind of window, was thinking about this window, and then Ray called and said, I found a certain window that you might like, which turned out to be the very window she was thinking about. This happened often enough for Gail and Ray. Ray, by the way, doesn't believe in telepathy at all. But Gail, being a very good receiver, he said, OK, have, you, have both of you come in, and we'll test to see whether or not there is really some kind of a telepathic connection here. So in this one, one trial, it took about 90 minutes, it took four of us to do it, we get a hit. So that's one trial with one hit. The skeptic would say, well, that's one example maybe selected out of thousands, and the other ones didn't work. So what happens when you have independent people try to repeat these things? So these experiments, very similar to this, or the same experiment has been investigated since about the 1920s up to the present. Lots of different universities around the world. When you look specifically at the Gonsfeld experiment and how many times it's been replicated, it's 122 experiments by 20 labs and over 4,600 sessions, of which the one you saw with Gale was one session. Multiply that by 4,600. The chance hit rate you see uh, is 25%. And each one of these little dots with, with the error bars is showing the result of each one of the 122 experiments. So you kind of at a glance, your eye can tell you that it looks like many of them worked. Some of them didn't work so good. So this is why meta-analysis has become so popular, because you can't always tell for a weak effect that something is actually real. So we'll now look at this in a cumulative fashion. And you can see much more clearly that we're not regressing to the mean of, of chance 25%, but we're actually going to 32%. You do the statistics on the likelihood of being at 32% where chance is 25%, the answer is odds against chance of 300 trillion quadrillion to 1, or 10 to the minus 30th. So this has been discussed many times in one of the top academic psychology journals, Psychological Bulletin. And so if any academic psychologist says that there's no evidence for any kind of psychic phenomena, it means that they're not reading their own journals. Well, oh, the other thing I want to say here is that about the past two decades, when you look at the, the effect that's being reported, and these, by the way, are unselected subjects. These are mostly college sophomores who are doing the test to get credit. So the fact that uh, we have a stable effect over the last 20 years is interesting because a skeptic would say, well, maybe all of these were done badly or it's the fluke or something like that. You should regress down to the mean, down to chance eventually, but we're not. We're becoming stable at 32%. At if we had selected out people who claim to be telepathic or family members or identical twins and people who face validity would suggest or have this ability, and that, that you can do in this database, then we're talking not 32%, but more like 50 to 60%. So much better results in this type of experiment. But because this is mostly composed of ordinary people, it suggests that we're dealing with a human ability, which is mostly unconscious. It's there, you can evoke it in the laboratory to a small extent, but it's a real effect. So what does odds of 300 trillion quadrillion to one actually mean? 
It means that if telepathy doesn't exist, we can run this experiment 300 trillion quadrillion times to get a result as good or better than what we actually observe. You add up how much time it would take to do that, it would be longer than the life of the universe. So it seems reasonably certain that something like telepathy exists. Then the skeptic could say, well, maybe these are not really well-designed experiments. Or maybe people aren't reporting all of the experiments, just they're reporting the good ones and they leave the other ones aside. So these are alternative explanations, some of which are built into the design and other ones are evaluated afterwards. Uh, they include things like, could there have been some kind of leakage about the target from one person to the other? Or reporting mistakes or on and on and on, selective reporting fraud on the part of the experimenters or fraud on the part of the subjects. But the bottom line always is, what happens if you have somebody who does not believe in telepathy or any kind of psychic experience at all, but does this experiment? What does a skeptic get? Well, we have no answer to that until 2005, because skeptics don't do experiments. They just complain about them. <laughs> so we have two professors uh, who, in their article, explicitly say they don't believe in any kind of psychic powers. But to their credit, they went ahead and did the Gonsfeld experiment, and they said, after eight studies, they had an overall statistically significant hit rate of 32%, which is what had been, we've been seeing for 40 years now. But because of their initial position, they added that this was precariously close to demonstrating humans do have psychic powers, and so we don't even believe our own results. <laughs> this is, this is a, a good entree, then, into Bayesian statistics. Because what I showed before was frequentist statistics. That's where you get the number like 300 trillion to one. Bayesian statistics takes into account the a priori bias of the analyst. So if the, if this, these people are, are, are biased to the point where they might think that the probability that telepathy exists is like 10 to the minus 20. And there are some skeptics who actually will, will admit that they're, they think it's true maybe to the point of 10 to the minus 20th, which is a pretty low probability. Basically says this cannot be. And then you take that a priori probability, you add it into the data that we know, and then you can make an assessment as to whether or not you should change your position. Well, if your initial position is 10 to the minus 20th, you're not going to change. It doesn't matter what happens. But if you're more reasonable and say, well, maybe, you know, maybe I'll accept it in one in a million chance, 10 to the minus 6, then the strength of the evidence should change your opinion dramatically. So the way we can analyze this now is something called the Bayes factor. You can only look at the column K. The other ones are more complicated to describe. So the column listed K is the Bayes factor, and this is showing you the odds ratio of two hypotheses. One hypothesis is that psychic ability exists, or in this case telepathy exists, and the other one is that it does not exist. And so if you end up with a Bayes factor of less than one, it means you're, you're favoring the other hypothesis, that psi does not exist. Telepathy doesn't exist, so that's why it says here, under strength of evidence, that is negative. When you go up to the top of the scale, greater than 10 to the 2 or greater than 100 to 1, then the rule of thumb is that this effect is decisive. So what do we find in the case of telepathy? Well, there was analysis done in a, a pretty good psychology journal. And the analysis shows here that for the Gonsfeld case, the results are 18 million to 1. Which is a little bit more than 100 to 1. So unless you come from a position where you think telepathy is impossible, almost everybody should change their mind based on this evidence because the, the telepathy hypothesis overpowers the non-telepathy hypothesis by 18 million to 1. There are other ways of looking at this, like in this case we're looking at remote viewing or clairvoyance, and here we have billions to 1 against chance. The strength of the evidence is sufficient at this point to convince even prominent lifelong skeptics, including uh, this psychology professor in, in the UK, a prominent skeptic, who has said in a magazine interview or, or a newspaper interview, I think that these studies do meet the usual standards for a normal claim. That means that if telepathy was not controversial, then the data would be overwhelming. This would not be, I mean, that people would simply accept it. But because telepathy is controversial, even Richard Wiseman doesn't accept the data. What it says, tells us is that this a priori probability that telepathy could exist is extremely low. It's down in the 10 to the minus 20th range. At some point, 
skepticism is, of course, necessary in science, but if, you're, if your a priori probabilities are so low that you don't accept the possibility of something, it's not even science anymore. I can go through the same kind of presentations for multiple forms of testing for telepathy, for clairvoyance, psychokinesis. There's probably a dozen different classes of experiments that people have done repeatedly. And I'm going to now talk about uh, one class of precognition studies. Question. Yeah. Is there an assumption that there's right or left brain associated with any of these? There's some evidence uh, from the neurosciences that, in general, the right hemisphere seems to be more associated with this than the left. But it's a crude, I mean, it's a crude way of thinking about it because the left and right are not really that different. So it's more form, function, impressionistic kinds of information and not language based and not analytical either. So some experiments have tried to send things like numbers and some people can pick up the numbers but most people cannot. They pick up shapes and forms and things that may have something to do with the way the number looks but not the number itself. So it's all right brain kind of stuff. So one of the kinds of experiments involves uh, something like a lie detector. You're taking physiological measures. So uh, Keanu uh, was selected to play the alien, which I think was a very good decision. Uh, and so this is a scene where he, he has a, this uh, physiology testing. So we use that method. We record skin conductance or heart rate or some other method continuously. Sit somebody down in front of a computer screen that is blank. Person presses a button, computer remains blank for five seconds. A computer randomly selects a photo. The photo might be calm like a bunny, unless you're scared of bunnies. Uh, or it might be scary like a snake, unless you're a herpetologist and you love snakes. So I, the reason I mention that is because any picture is going to be perceived in an idiosyncratic way. So we try to choose pictures that most people would respond to in the appropriate manner, so calm or emotional. And then the screen goes blank for a while, and then you're, this is repeated 30 to 40 times. And that's one session. It takes most people 15 to 20 minutes to go through this experiment. We tell people that if you see an emotional picture, wait a while for your heartbeat to slow down so that you go back to baseline. And sometimes people do that, and sometimes they don't. But in general, we try to encourage that so we get a good measure. So here's an example of a calm picture, example of a positive emotional picture, another calm picture, and a negative emotional picture, unless you like the Die Hard movies, which is where this is from. So what do you get? Well, from the moment that the image appears, it's well understood what happens. If you see an emotional picture, your, your sympathetic nervous system has a big arousal, you see that in skin conductance. And before you see, or after you see a calm picture, you have a little tiny arousal because you were expecting to see something and then it was calm and you don't care. So that's understood. Now the question is what happens before the image appears because it is randomly selected and nobody knows what it is? And that's the answer. Take the average of all the emotional pictures, the average of the calm pictures. This difference we call a presentiment or I call a presentiment response because it's not precognition, it's not conscious. It's an unconscious physiological response to something that's about to unfold. So that was in skin conductance. We've done this now in the brain where instead of using pictures, we just use whether a light flashes or doesn't flash. So there's a picture of somebody in the lab doing the experiment. There's a picture of the brains of the women in the experiment. The big, when you, uh, she, the women saw a light flash, their brain has a big response, it peaks at around 300 milliseconds, it's very well understood. They don't get a light flash, then you have attention required for Xfinity. <laughs> I don't want to go to Xfinity. So what you get is, again, a difference in brain uh, function one second before there's a light flash or not flash, but only in women. And in general, women do this test a lot better than men, this particular test. So that's in the brain. We've done the same kind of thing in pupil dilation, and in pupil dilation you see a very big difference in pupil dilation about three seconds before the image appears. 
again, these are randomly selected. In most of these experiments, we use a true random generator so that it's unpredictable even by the computer. The computer reaches out for a number and the machine gives it a number and presents the picture. And by the way, the picture is selected immediately before it's shown. So the physiology is already recorded before the stimulus is selected. Here's another example where we were testing a claim of non-dual meditators. Uh, these are meditation methods like Zogchen. Uh, where the meditators say that they achieve a state of spaciousness and timelessness. Because the, in the non-dual method, you're trying to get rid of all kinds of dualisms, including here and then and now and then and so on. So they claim they, they achieve a state of timelessness, and we wanted to test that using this design. And then to get eight controls who had never meditated. So the standard joke here is we're in Northern California, and it's very hard to find people who have never meditated. And we had to find people who were both gender and age matched as well to the meditators. It took us much longer to find the controls. So we took 32 channels of EEG. And again, the stimuli are very simple. It's, it's either a light flash or an audio tone at random times. So we look into the brains. I'm just going to show one channel. We see similar effects in some of the other channels. So in the controls, after the stimulus occurs, a light flash or an audio tone, there are different portions of the brain that process that information, so it's not surprising that you get a different response. But beforehand, there's no difference in the controls. In the meditators, again, afterwards, you see a response. Beforehand, there's a big difference. So their brains were gearing up, in this case, about a second and a half before seeing a randomly selected stimulus of one type versus the next. And that actually supports the ontological reality of awareness being spread through time. Because if their awareness was not spread through time, then they would look like the controls. So, so, so this is a way that we're, we're beginning to use this more and more as a way of looking at subjective experience where it's very difficult to know if it's an illusion or not. You can use these kinds of techniques to see is it objectively true as well. So we know that at least for the meditators on average, that they talk about timelessness, to some extent they are extended in time. These are men and women. These are both men and women. Uh, oh, and I forgot to mention that average, I think average of 25 years of a daily practice of meditation. And specifically, a non-dual form of meditation. So we're asked sometimes, well, what form of meditation is best? We don't know. I, I think it probably doesn't matter too much, but in order to make a uniform group in this case, we chose only people doing non-dual non forms of meditation. So we published many articles on this, articles, 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 using these physiological methods. And the bottom line, as usual, is what about repeatability? So we've closed all of the loopholes in terms of the design that would make it a mistake. We know it's not a mistake, but could other people get the same results? So here's a colleague from the University of Amsterdam who did the same kind of study in a functional MRI to see where in the brain these effects would show up. He'd used calm and emotional pictures. So the prediction was that if there's a difference, it ought to appear in the amygdala because it's a portion of the brain that processes emotion. And in fact, if you look, you can see that the differential part of the brain that lit up was the amygdala. The amygdala is the thing that is reacting before the emotional picture comes up. Here's a, a colleague at the Institute of Heart Math, and they specialize in heart, the heart, so they did an experiment measuring heart rate, and again, got very nice presentiment results, both in people meditating before and afterwards. It's a little bit strange because at the Institute of Heart Math, everybody meditates all the time. So there really isn't much of a before meditation condition. But nevertheless, in this case, in the emotional targets, the heart rate decelerates. Because if you see an emotional event, your heart rate doesn't increase. That does eventually, but it has a deceleration effect. So that's what they saw. But it's heart rate decrease. Yeah. It's actually beat to beat beat the beat interval. So it's not heart rate variability. It's actually beat to beat, beat, to beat interval, not the average beat to beat interval. Uh, so this was a meta-analysis published in Frontiers in Psychology looking at, at the issue of replication using this formalized mm -hmm. method of meta-analysis. This article was downloaded 65,000 times. So that's notable because most 
articles and scientific literature, you're doing really well if maybe 100 people look at it. So this indicates 65,000 people looking at it, people are interested in this topic, but they don't often publicly admit it. So CIS is an unusual place where people probably would admit that they had a precognitive experience and would be very happy to tell you about it. This does not occur in, in orthodox academia. You are shunned if you do that and probably won't get tenure if you don't have it yet. So people, all kinds of people are interested in it. And the results of the meta-analysis, oh, by the way, sometimes a, a skeptic will say that, well, you didn't do the meta-analysis correctly. That's like an easy way to get out of believing anything. In this case, our statistician is the current president of the American Statistical Association. So we can deflect the skeptics to the ASA and say, well, they don't know what they're doing, then we give up. <laughs> uh, Jessica is also the chair of the statistics department at uh, UC Irvine and, and has been involved in this field in one way or the other for a very long time. So they found 26 experiments. Overall, the probability is 10 to the minus 12, or odds of about a billion to one, saying that before an emotional event occurs or before a stimulus occurs, the body in, in many different ways is responding beforehand. Some people can sense this, not very many. So we asked people in these experiments, just before the emotional picture arose, did you feel your heart rate, heart rate increasing or start sweating or something? Most people say no. They don't, they don't feel anything consciously, even though their bodies do. Occasionally you'll find somebody who says, yeah, my heart started palpitating and then the emotional thing came up. So it's, it's rare, as we find in many of these phenomena, that with unselected people, most are not consciously psychic, but unconsciously they are. So here's another kind of uh, experiment called uh, involving implicit decisions. And what we find again and again is you ask somebody to consciously do a miracle in the laboratory, they can't do it very well. If you ask them to do something else, like we're just going to ask you to look at pictures, and we're going to monitor your heart rate, you're not asking anyone to do anything psychic. And it, 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 it's an easy way of basically saying we're going to look at your unconscious responses, which are much more psychic than your conscious responses. And this is in that, that kind of idea. So what I'm doing now is I'm priming you with a picture of a lady's face. And if I were really priming it in a, in a uh, subliminal way, I would show that and then I would quickly mask it. And I would do this a bunch of times, but fast enough so you couldn't actually see the face. But it's in your head. You see it anyway. <coughs> so now that you're primed with that face, I present you with a task. Which student is more likable? So these are pairs of pictures that have been prejudged by a bunch of people that have equal likability. So you're now presented with a difficult task, like which one of these is going to be more likable? Because you were primed, you're very likely to select that one. And this is a well-known effect in social psychology called the mere exposure effect. And this is the reason why you, you constantly see advertisements for McDonald's or Pepsi or Coke or whatever, that the, the constant repetition of the thing will make you choose that as the more favorable effect when you're in the grocery store. So you're looking at a huge array of things that you could select. You're going to select the one that comes to mind more, most readily, which is the one that you've been inculcated with in advertising. So here's a mere exposure effect. It goes from the past to the present. Your, your prime is in the past. Your selection is in the present. This is decisions in the present being influenced by past priming. This is conventional stuff. The new element here now is the same experiment reversed in time. So to reverse it in time, I present you again with this task, which student is more likable? And they're equally likable. So you make a decision. I'll say, well, I don't know, maybe that one. Now, we make a random decision. So we're going to toss the die. And we were going to prime you with the randomly selected prime afterwards. It might be subliminal prime. It might be a liminal prime. But nevertheless, it's after that you've already made your decision. If there's precognition going on, then your future prime will influence your decision in the present. So this is a complete reversal of the usual mere exposure effect. It's a backwards in time effect. It's a retrocausal influence. In this case, decisions in the present influenced by a future prime. And there are lots of variations on this. So a colleague at Cornell University named Daryl Bem did nine experiments of this type using reversed standard experiments, reversed in time, Overall, got a whoppingly significant result, probability of 10 to the minus 11. 
published it in a, a high-tier uh, social psychology journal, and it upset a lot of people. So the New York Times felt compelled to actually have a uh, an editorial by their science director that the paper, which had not even been published yet, is about to be published, and you should be outraged that a journal would publish a paper on precognition in the New York Times. So. They said the decision made to like believers in so-called paranormal events, but it is already mortifying scientists. Which, among other things, says that if you're a scientist, you cannot believe, by fiat, according to the New York Times, you can't believe in anything paranormal because precognition is paranormal. So that's what, the, that's what we learned from the New York Times. The bottom line always is, is it repeatable? So Daryl Ben was very clever and created a software program that would allow people to easily repeat these experiments. And so after a couple of years went by, there were 90 replications. Uh, as we find a meta-analysis, some of them worked, some of them didn't work. The blue line is where is zero, which would be the prediction that this is not a real effect. But the overall average is the red line, and it's not zero. In fact, it's a quite a strong effect. So we know that this is a repeatable effect. Many of the people who repeated it were either sympathetic or had no prior reason to believe it or not believe it. Some were very skeptical. But a lot of people did repetitions. So this is part of the meta-analysis, the, the analytical results. And I'll just point out here that uh, all experiments together give a probability of 10 to the minus 10. And only looking at the independent replications, meaning the ones that Daryl Ben did not do, still had a pretty healthy result, 10 to the minus 5. The base factor is 3,800 to 1. So as I said before, a base factor of 100 to 1 is considered decisive evidence. And we're, here we have 3,800 to there are still skeptics who say that meta-analysis is not right, that there's something wrong inherently with meta-analysis mm -hmm. because this can't be true. But that's extreme skepticism. So the status for evidence on precognition, there are four classes of experiments. All of them show odds against chance of a gazillion to one, whether you look at it in frequentist statistics or Bayesian statistics. So I would say to the skeptics, just get over it. It's a real phenomenon. What's happening recently, you're probably aware that within psychology and social psychology, everybody's up at arms because things that thought to be replicable, uh, repeatable, uh, are turned out to be not so repeatable after all. And so everyone's jumping around saying that uh, we're in a crisis because things which we thought were true are not true. And what the, the, this is now a hot topic in psychology. It is a hot topic in psychology every 25 years. Go back 25 years, you'll find editorials written about the crisis in psychology over the difficulty of replication. Go back 50 years, you find the same thing. Like every generation has to learn anew a very simple thing about human performance, which is it varies a lot. If you're trying to study something that's subtle or even not so subtle, you need huge amounts of data in order to be able to see stable effects. So we're very lucky in the case of something like precognition that there were 90 replications done pretty quickly, and overall it shows it's a real effect. It is repeated. So skeptic cat is not so sure. <laughs> Perceptions unlimited by space and time. And the other part of this is uh, I've presented a lot of evidence. Um, sometimes people will look at the evidence. But most of the time, they want to hit you over the head with it. <laughs> because the New York Times told us we should be outraged at this. And the Times must be correct. So what do we do with this? The reason why these effects are still considered very controversial is primarily because of the paradigm of existing science. So science today tells us, according to the neurosciences, that you're nothing but a pack of neurons and you're a machine made of meat. That's the prevailing view. You go to the Society for Neuroscience meetings, there are 30,000 people there, and most of them accept this. This is a brochure from the Society for Neuroscience. This, of course, is reductive materialism. In reductive materialism, you start with physics somewhere at the bottom, and then chemistry, biology, psychology, and awareness is somewhere an emergent property which is more or less meaningless at the very top. From that perspective, any kind of psychic phenomena is extremely difficult to understand because we're talking about human experience events that are occurring up at the top of this pyramid, but they have characteristics which we see at very deep physics. So how do you make the connection between the top of the pyramid and the bottom? And the answer is you can't, not very easily. So here we're dealing with an emergence model. 
Everything emerges from, from bottom up. It's a strict one-way causation. And there can be and are interactions between these artificial boundaries here, physics, chemistry, and biology, but you don't find huge leaps. You don't find leaps of awareness all the way down to deep physics, according to this model. So there's theory number two, more like the Vedanta approach or uh, Western idealism. The consciousness is fundamental in some way. And so it's idealism, panpsychism, neutral modism, whatever term you want to use. The only thing that we need to do for our existing knowledge pyramid is to take the awareness and stick it at the bottom. And this is important because it means that within a discipline, you don't have to throw away the textbooks. So one of the objections about idealism sometimes is that, well, everything we know is that it's, none of it's true anymore. Well, that's not the case. The textbooks within a discipline are correct, but the fundamental assumption on which all of knowledge is, is sitting is probably incorrect. So if we have this model, then awareness, just like electrons, permeate everything. The awareness comes before the electrons, before space and time. What this allows us to, to see then is, if you have an experience of awareness that is transcending time and space, which is what the bottom of the pyramid is like, and which is like all psychic and mystical experience, it makes sense, because that's where it came from in the first place. So again, you're going to have interactions between uh, the disciplines, and there is a way of coming from pure awareness, which is before space-time, and developing it into physics in the way that we currently see it. If you're not familiar with uh, G. Spencer Brown's Laws of Form, that's one approach that you can take. Look it up. So, I would say then that nothing about the extraordinary capacities of consciousness makes any sense at all, unless consciousness is fundamental in some way. This, of course, what I just said here, and in this crowd is, everyone's nodding. In the conventional crowd, there's going to be a lot of grimacing, because if this is kind of saying that what we thought was true about the knowledge pyramid is not exactly true. And, and, we're, and anybody who goes through a conventional uh, educational program is inculcated from day one that this is the way it is. It's very hard to twist your mind. As Sir Arthur Eddington said in 1934, it's difficult for the matter of, matter of fact physicists to accept the view that the substratum of everything is of mental character. 1934. Here we have 2005, and another physicist is saying the only reality is mind and observations. And observations are not of things. Physicists shy from the truth because the truth is so alien to everyday physics. The universe is entirely mental. You will find physicists and other scientists to say this. The reason why I mention it here is because this is published in Nature. So this means that even within the orthodoxy of science today, there is a little bit of a crack opening for more and more scientists of different disciplines to say, you know what, panpsychism or something like that seems to be making more and more sense. So I think we're in the middle of a paradigm shift. Uh, here, for example, is a PBS uh, uh, article on consciousness as a state of matter by the physicists Tegmark at MIT. So what he's saying is consciousness might be a state of matter or thought about as a state of matter. <coughs> Just there's many types of liquids, maybe there are many types of consciousness. What he does not say is that if consciousness is a state of matter, then maybe matter is a state of consciousness, which is exactly what I was just saying before. That physics arise out of this substance of awareness in some way. Here's another example. The Royal Society publishes this article by Tononi, who's a physicist, and Koch, who's a neuroscientist. Consciousness here, there, and everywhere. So more and more neuroscientists, even though they're, they're within a, uh, a paradigm where consciousness is supposed to emerge out of the brain, they're beginning to change their mind as well. And then this last one is a Complex Theory of Consciousness in Scientific American, which is very orthodox in terms of the way they think about things. And here, too. Maybe there's a panpsychist view of consciousness. So the paradigm shift, a lot of it is uh, still a, ma a matter of sticking your head in the sand, or whatever that substance is. Uh, but I think that having been involved in this field for about 30 years now, that from 30 years ago to now, there is a dramatic change, and mostly around the past five years. So I think what's going to happen is that Ten years from now, when they present evidence for a psychic or mystical experience, people will say, well, of course, that had to happen. It has to be true, given the way that we understand this knowledge pyramid. 
And skepticism will still be around, of course, because it does, still doesn't match our everyday awareness. But I think we're going to see a major change. And that's the end. Thank you. Thank you.